Hello, I'm Dave, and I'm here with Playthrough Board Games. Today we are going to take a look at the Skull and Shackles base set of the Pathfinder Adventure card game. Specifically, I will be taking us through the fourth scenario of the basic adventure path. In this adventure, we will be combating a scourge of the seas who has attacked ships recently. Before we get into that, I would like to address a few feedback comments on my previous video. One suggested that it would be helpful if I showed you location decks after I closed them. In order to do this, I will be taking a still photo of any cards from the location deck that might affect or might have affected my playthrough and talking about why that would be the case. Another comment said that it would be helpful if I showed you spells, weapons, items, or other cards that I am playing to affect my checks. In order to do this, I will be using the same method of taking still photos and demonstrating what about these cards I am using to succeed at various checks to acquire boons or defeat banes. That being said, let's take a look at the scenario card itself and discuss what the objectives are, and then we will move on to looking at individual locations and discussing how they will affect our playthrough of the game. Thank you for coming along. To review, I completed the island hopping scenario in my first playthrough. Joseph played through Rum Punch, and he will play through Dangerous Waters for you. I will be playing through the scenario Sunken Treasure. In Rum Punch, we had to face off against Nefti Unwesha and her band of ruffians and convince her and hers to leave us alone. In order to do so, I convinced a group of allies to join us, and we all approached her and stopped her. In the scenario Dangerous Waters, your ship is constantly imperiled both from the environment around you and also from other pirates, like the one pictured here who is the main villain, Gemma Redclaw. In order to prevent Gemma from taking our ship, we have to take hers and defeat her at her own game. We saw in the previous scenario a number of destroyed ships in a location called the Shipwreck Graveyard. It turns out that what we were witnessing was not coincidence, but rather the handiwork of Kelizar the Brine Dragon. In order to stop this destruction of ships of the Shackles, we seek out Kelizar and strive to defeat him. What is unique about this scenario is that it does not necessarily end with the defeat of the villain, even if the villain has nowhere to flee. So we may banish Kelizar before ending the scenario. We only succeed at the scenario when all locations are permanently closed. Since locations play such an important role in this scenario, let's take a look at each. Let's take a look at the Sea Caves first. At the start of your turn at the Sea Caves, you must succeed at a Constitution or Fortitude 6 check or bury a card. On closing, you must summon and defeat a random monster with the Aquatic trait. The Wishing Well location is one of the more interesting locations in this particular scenario. At this location, you automatically succeed at checks to acquire boons. However, you are automatically haunted by a Pirate Shade, which affects you negatively when you confront Banes. To close this location, you must succeed at an Intelligence or Knowledge 8 check. Fortunately, on closing, you banish all haunts next to your character card. Let's take a look at the haunt here. The haunt is displayed face up next to your character card. The difficulty of checks is increased by one or two if your check has a swashbuckling trait. Many cards add the swashbuckling trait to checks, so this will be difficult. In this instance, you do not make checks for boons, so the only checks that will be adversely affected are your checks to defeat banes. Furthermore, the information at the bottom of the card here about attempting to close a location that this henchman came from does not apply. The Pirate Shade Haunt, in this case, did not come from the Wishing Well location deck, but rather was summoned from the box, and so the location will remain open. The next location, the Beach, has an interesting at this location ability. At the start of your turn, you may discard a card and recharge a random card from your discard pile. In my opinion, this would mostly be useful if you had something in your hand that you did not care about and something in your discard pile that you really, really did. On closing, you may shuffle an item from your discard pile into your deck. 
so you do get a little more choice when you actually succeed at closing the location. Ultimately, however, the when closing effect offsets most of the benefits of the when permanently closed effect, in my opinion. Unless, of course, the card you bury is something that you do not care about. To bury a card, you must put it under your character card, and under most circumstances, you lose access to the card you bury for the rest of the scenario. The last location we will be looking at is the harbor. At this location, when you acquire a boon, any one character may move to another location. There may be some strategic implications to this. Let's discuss. What might be useful about moving a character to another location could be that in acquiring or defeating certain cards, multiple checks come into play. A character must make one check on a card he or she encounters, but does not have to make multiple checks to acquire or defeat that card, so having multiple characters in the same place might help in this regard. A more basic reason why a character may wish to move from another location is simply that he or she is having a difficult time at a particular location. Word of caution, though, moving away from the Wishing Well location with Pirate Haunts attached to your character brings the Pirate Haunts with you. Finally, it is worth noting that this location is where your ship is docked for the duration of this scenario. When your ship is anchored in a particular place, the ship may not move to another location, and only characters at the particular location are considered to be commanding the ship instead of characters at general locations when the ship is simply placed next to the scenario card. At this location where our ship is docked, we have a special bonus. If your check to defeat a ship has a swashbuckling trait, you may discard a card from the Blessings deck to add 1d12 to that check. Since our ship is anchored at the harbor, only at the harbor, if we encounter a ship, will this come into play. I'm not holding my breath that this will actually happen during my scenario, but we never know. Now that we have explored the various mechanics and locations that will affect our playthrough, let's begin. I wanted to take a moment as we get started to remind you of my character's powers. Alahazra may recharge a card that has a divine trait to examine the top card of any location deck. At the end of her turn she may discard a card that has a divine trait to add a card with the divine trait from her discard pile into her hand. And finally, she may add 2 to her combat check if her attack has the attack trait. Celtiel has two special abilities here. He has one that allows him to choose a weapon without the two-handed trait and a spell that has the attack trait. When he's doing a combat check, he may use one to primarily attack with and recharge the other to gain a d6 on that check. He also may attempt to recharge a card from his discard pile before resetting his hand if that card is a spell. It is Celtiel's turn to start here, and we will flip the Blessing deck card here, a Blessing of the Gods, and we will go exploring. Celtiel is at the harbor location, which I have explained in the video before this, so if you want to rewind and see what that involves, you may do that. At this location, we encounter the shipwreck. I will show you the shipwreck in detail here, but this is the henchman for this scenario, so it's interesting to have encountered one so early on. Shipwreck is a unique kind of henchman in the sense that it is a barrier card. The difficulty to defeat this would be increased by the adventure deck number, however we do not have an adventure deck number since this is the basic adventure deck. If undefeated, we may banish the barrier. If defeated, we add one plunder card from the box to our hand and may immediately attempt to close the location that the henchman came from. In order to defeat the shipwreck, Celtiel will roll his 2d8. His constitution is a d8, and he will play a blessing to increase his roll to a second d8. Let's see how we do versus the shipwreck. Here we go. So the results here are an 8 and a 3, so we do successfully manage to defeat the shipwreck in this instance. 
Now we will roll on the plunder table. To consult the plunder table, we simply roll 1d6 and see what the result indicates. In this case, I have rolled a 5. And we will take a look at the table, which tells us that a 5 is an ally. So we draw a random ally from the box to our hand, and then we may attempt to close a location. The ally I drew is called a Chantry Singer. We may reveal this card to avoid being moved to a location or discard it to explore our location. Let's see if we can successfully close the location we are at. It turns out that we may easily close this location because the requirement is to shuffle a boon from our hand into a deck. So we are going to take the Chanty Singer and shuffle it into Alahazra's Wishing Well location. The Wishing Well, if you recall, is a location where we may acquire any card automatically that is a boon at the price of being haunted by a pirate shade, henchman. So, this guarantees that we will get the Chanty Singer again, and now the harbor is closed. When we close a location, we remove all cards from that location and flip over the location card. I will now show you the cards that are in the deck of the harbor just to give you a sense of what we may have missed out on. Let's take a brief look at what was in the deck we just closed. There was an ally, the carver. We've had access to the carver before. There was a mercenary, which we would have had to have defeated. There were a couple armors here, which we've also seen before and were not particularly unique. The main loss, in my opinion, is this Cutlass, plus one. This card would have allowed us some more attack power. There was also a musket, but seeing as it is a ranged weapon, we don't benefit terribly from it. There was a barrier called Lookout Duty, which might have caused us to damage our ship, seeing as our ship was anchored at this location. And there's a Potion of Glibness and a Rum Bottle. The Potion of Glibness is good for acquiring allies, but we are already pretty good at that with Alahazra, so it's not a terrible loss. On closing the harbor, we may give a card in our deck to a character at another location per the rules of the harbor. However, Seltiel does not see the need to do that, so he will recharge, rather reset his hand, and end his turn. It is now Alahazra's turn at the Wishing Well location. We will flip the Blessing from the Blessing deck to start her turn, and she will explore her location. She encounters a barrier called the Trapped Locker. In order to defeat the barrier, she must roll a Dexterity Disable 9 or a Strength Melee 11. Both of those checks, if you have watched from previous encounters, would be fairly difficult for her. However, she may have a trick up her sleeve in the form of her Ruby of Charisma. Let's take a look at the Ruby of Charisma. The Ruby of Charisma allows me to replace the die roll I would have to make with Alahazra's Charisma die instead. Her Charisma die roll is a d12 plus 2, which is substantially higher than the roll I would have to make if I used her Dexterity or Strength die. At this point, Alahazra will be recharging her Ruby of Charisma as well as playing a Blessing of the Gods on her check, which will add one extra d12 to her check to defeat this barrier. Let's roll the dice and see what the outcome is. So I rolled a 4 and a 2, which adds up to 6, which is not a strong roll. At this point, we have failed to defeat the Trapped Locker using our Dexterity check. If undefeated, discard the top 1d4 minus 1 cards from your deck. So now we have a negative outcome. Let's see what the number of cards we must discard from Alhazra's deck is. 1d4 minus 1. So we locked out and rolled a 1. 1 minus 1 is 0, of course, so we do not have to do anything. That was a close call. There is a monster in the deck of the Wishing Well location, however, there is only one, and Alhazra is feeling fairly confident, so she is going to play a ally to explore again. We have a parrot here that has the text to discard it to explore your location. Many allies do have this ability. In this case, we encounter the Chanty Singer. 
presumably the one that was inserted by Selfiel into the deck. Unfortunately, as a result of this, we will get the Pirate Shade Haunt in front of Alahazra's character card here. We display this card, and it increases the difficulty of our checks by one or two if we have the swashbuckling trait added to our check. Many of our ally cards add the swashbuckling trait to our check when we explore again, so this may adversely affect us if we do encounter the monster. At this point, Alahazra will be playing the Jinx Eater, which will allow her to explore her location again. The Jinx Eater does not add the swashbuckling trait, mercifully, so the Pirate Shade Haunt will not adversely affect us. We have found a spell called Fear. Seeing as we automatically acquire boons at this location, I will add that to my hand, and I also get another Pirate Shade Haunt. So my checks to defeat things are becoming increasingly difficult if I have the swashbuckling trait added to my check. I now have two Pirate Shade Haunts in front of me. However, I also have the ability to keep exploring. The Chanty Singer has the same text as many other allies, so I will discard this card to keep exploring. We find yet another ally, the Old Salt, whom we acquire. He also allows us to discard him to explore our location, which we will do we acquire a Blessing of the Gods, which we will also use to continue our exploration. At this point, we have encountered the Shipwreck. Let's take a look at what happens. As with previous checks, the Shipwreck has the same amount here to defeat as all of its copies in all of the decks, namely a Constitution Fortitude 5 check. Alahazra's constitution is a d6, which doesn't give us a whole lot to go on here. We will be playing a Blessing of the Gods to boost our ability to try and defeat the shipwreck. In this case, we will roll 2d6 instead of the standard 1. I have rolled a 6, which is just enough to defeat the shipwreck. If defeated, we add one plunder card from the box to our hand and may immediately attempt to close the location. I will now roll on the plunder table and we'll see what the result is in a moment. I've rolled a four. After consulting the plunder table I had discovered that a four is an item card so I do get the old salts bandana. This says to reveal this to add the swashbuckling trait to your check Seeing as I have the Pirate Shade Haunts in front of me, adding the swashbuckling trait to my check is very undesirable because it will only make my check more difficult. In this case, we have the Wishing Well location to close it. We must succeed at an Intelligence or Knowledge 8 check. Let's see if the Pirate Shade Haunts affect this check. The Pirate Shade Haunt has an increase of 2 if I add the swashbuckling trait to my check, so I will not be doing that. However, it normally has an increase of 1 to the difficulty of any check I might have to make, so instead of an 8, my check is now a 10 because I have two pirate shade haunts in front of my character. In order to defeat this, I'll have my work cut out for me. Alahazra's intelligence is a d6, and with the knowledge intelligence subcategory she gets a plus two bonus seeing as this is a knowledge intelligence check to close the wishing well she has a d6 plus two bonus in order to try to help her out Celtiel will play a blessing to give her two d6 however she only gets the plus two bonus once I believe the chance of me successfully closing the wishing well is pretty slim with the pirate shade haunts in front of me. Let's find out if I'm correct. I have gotten lucky. I rolled a 6 and a 4, which is enough, even with the pirate shade haunts in front of me, to close the wishing well location. 
let's see if there is anything in the deck that is worth noting and see what the closing effects are for this location. If you recall from the beginning of our playthrough here, the Wishing Well, when closing, allows me to banish all Pirate Shade haunts in front of my character, which is very helpful. So I will be banishing the two Pirate Shade haunts that are in front of Alahazra at this point in time. In the deck, we had left over Magic Weapon, a portion, potion of Fortitude, a Blood Moon Pirate, which looks like a fairly sizable enemy, but we do not have to encounter any of these cards, and two Blessings of the Gods. There is nothing in the deck that would prevent me from closing the location any longer, so we have succeeded at closing our second location in two turns, which is not bad. At this point, we will flip over a Blessing for Celtio. We flip over the Blessing of Achikik from the Blessings deck, and he may now continue along his way. We will be leaving the harbor location and either moving to the sea caves or the beach. Let's examine our options. I have decided to move Celtiel to the sea caves. The reason for this is, is that the when closing effect requires us to defeat an aquatic monster, which might be slightly harder for Alahazra to pull off, Whereas at the beach here, all you have to do to close is bury a card, which either character could do fairly easily as long as they had any cards in their hand. So, let's explore the sea cave location. We encounter a buckler, which is an armor. In order to acquire this, we have to get a constitution fortitude 3. Our constitution with Celtiel is a d8, so this seems like a good choice of a location so far. Let's see if he can encounter this buckler. I have rolled a 6 here, so we will see if we can use the buckler for anything. I'm sure it will reduce some damage to my character. At this point, I do not have any other ability that would allow me to keep exploring. I will probably discard the buckler from my hand in hopes of drawing a card that would allow me to continue my explorations on my next turn as I reset my hand right now. We will move to Alahazra's turn, and she is also at a closed location, and she must likewise move as Celtiel did. So we flip up the blessing for her. It's a generic blessing of the gods from the blessings deck. This leaves the beach for her to move to, and we will take a look at what she encounters over there. The beach location that Alahaz removes to has a ability that says at the start of her turn she may discard a card from her hand to recharge a random card from her discard pile. Seeing as we did not start our turn at this location, however, that effect does not apply to us at this point in time. You will note that I have moved the decks around slightly, so over here is the harbor and just out of view is the Wishing Well location, both of which are now closed. I've also put the Blessing deck here, so you can effectively see what Blessing I flip. So that was just a convenience factor. She may explore her location, and we encounter a enemy here, the Pirate Captain. Before you act, recharge a card. So the first thing we must do is recharge a card from our hand. In this case, I encountered a spell at the Wishing Well location that I do not believe I will need to use, so we will simply recharge that spell. The other cards in my hand may be relevant to defeating the Pirate Captain. Let's see what other rules apply to us here. The difficulty of the check is increased by the adventure deck number of the current scenario, as we've covered before, there is no adventure deck number currently, so that does not bother us currently. We may not play allies that have the pirate trait, so if there were any allies that had the pirate trait, they could not help us in this check. Finally, after we act, the pirate captain deals two structural damage to our ship, which is unfortunate as one of our characters would have to discard two cards to prevent the structural damage from taking place. But first things first, we have to find a way to defeat the Combat 13 check for the Pirate Captain. 
Alahazra has a number of attack spells in her hand, which give us some options. The spell she is going to opt to use is Fireblade. She will discard this to use her Divine Die, plus 2d4. Her Divine Die is a d12, plus 2d4 will hopefully give us a sufficient amount to defeat the pirate captain. However, since the check to defeat is a 13 and still a large check despite all of this, Ahasra is going to go ahead and play a Blessing of the Gods on her check to be on the safe side, which adds another d12. Now that we have assembled all these dice, let's roll and see how well we do. It turns out my fears were unfounded. I rolled an 11, a 3, a 2, and a 7, which was more than sufficient to defeat the 13 that we would need for the captain. Now that I have defeated the captain, we do have to deal with the potential damage to our ship. What happens if I let the ship get damaged is that we will lose the plunder card by the end of this turn, that is underneath it that we start the scenario with. In order to prevent this, one character must discard cards equal to the damage that would be dealt, as I mentioned. This puts us in a little bit of a sore spot, however, we will discard Force Missile and Cutlass from Celtil's hand, which does weaken him slightly for next turn but we have prevented the loss of whatever is under our plunder card here for the start of the game. At this point, Alahazra is going to try to attempt to recharge Fireblade. We must achieve an 8 to recharge this spell using our Divine Die. She has failed quite spectacularly by rolling a 2. That being the case, she is going to do a couple things to end her turn out here. She has Cure. Cure allows me to roll a d4 and get that many cards back into my deck. Plus one. So my roll is a one. One plus one is two. So I take two cards and shuffle them back into my deck. From my discard pile when we shuffle the discard pile I take the top two cards here without looking at them and just shuffle them into my deck so I don't know what exactly I'm getting back and then we will see if we recharge cure successfully or not I roll a d12 8 I needed an 8 to recharge the spell Cure, so I do successfully recharge Cure, which is an option that you may take after playing a spell, is to attempt to recharge it. I have nothing to allow me to keep exploring, so I will reset my hand to my 6 card hand size from my deck, and end my turn with Alahazra. We flip a blessing for Celtio's turn, from the blessing deck and go exploring. He finds a spell detect magic that is an arcane 2 check. His arcane is a d8 plus 3 so there's no way we can fail this check. I rolled a 4 so a d8 plus 3 so 4 plus 3 is 7 versus the 2 on detect magic here. The power of Detect Magic says, During your turn, discard this card to examine the top card of your location deck. If it is a blessing or has a magic trait, you may immediately encounter it, otherwise return it to the top of the deck. So we get to sneak a little peek. It is the shipwreck. So that is neither a blessing nor a spell or anything else with the magic trait. So we may attempt to recharge the spell here, so I can roll another d8. What I need is a 4 to successfully recharge. Let's see if I can do that. 2 plus 3 
will give us the requisite number that we need, so we do recharge the spell we just acquired. Now the question is, is whether I want to try and encounter the ship wreck, but I do not have any blessings in my hand or allies to keep exploring, so I will reset my hand and end my turn with Celtiel. Let's move on to Alahazra's turn now. We flip the blessing of Achekek again and place it off to the side from the blessing deck. And Alahazra may continue to explore. She encounters magic weapon, which requires a divine four check to acquire. She will just roll and see what happens. She rolls an 11 on her divine die so she has successfully acquired the spell magic weapon she does have a blessing of the gods in order to allow her to keep exploring her location so she will do this she encounters a chain shirt which is an armor that has a constitution fortitude 4 her constitution is a d6 she will simply roll. This is a basic armor, so it's not really worth bolstering her attempt to get, in my opinion. We roll a 1, which fails to acquire the chain shirt, and it is simply removed from play. She does not have anything else to allow her to continue to explore at this point. Her hand size is at 6, because she has acquired a spell this turn. And that being the case, she will simply end her turn. It is now Celtiel's turn. We flip another blessing from the top of the deck. And he will explore his location, the sea caves, and in fact encounter the shipwreck that we knew was there from his spell he cast last turn. Again, Constitution Fortitude 5 check. His Constitution is a D8. He will be playing a blessing just to try and make sure that he can do this. So 2d8 to defeat the 5 check here. 6 and a 1 is sufficient to defeat this 5 on the shipwreck. He may now attempt to close the location. So what we have to do is find a monster with the aquatic trait and encounter it and if we successfully defeat the monster we have closed the sea cave location. What I did to get a random aquatic monster was simply drew from the top of the monster deck in the box until I found something with the aquatic trait. The monster I found is called Merfolk. It has a combat check of 8 to defeat, and if undefeated, each character at this location must succeed at a Constitution Fortitude 7 check or bury the top card of his deck. Let's see if I can successfully do this combat 8. I should have no problem, as Celtiel is a fairly proficient fighter. We will reveal the Morning Star, which allows us to use our strength or melee skill plus 1d8. In addition we have a spell with the attack trait called Frostbite. The special ability Celtiel has allows him to recharge that to add a d6. That makes for a total of 2d8 plus 1d6 to get an 8 so we should be fairly confident in our ability to defeat. Four, three, and two, plus our three bonus on Celtiel's character card allows us to handily defeat the Merfolk. At this point, the location is now closed of the sea caves, and we may confidently proceed with our adventure. In the sea cave location that we just closed, there was a task called Pirate Hunting, which we may see in another adventure. There is a card called Botswain, which was an ally. There is a Blessing of Milani. There is a Blessing of the Gods, 
There was a big monster called the Sea Drake with a combat 14 check. There's a human smuggler who had a combat 9 to defeat. And a basic cutlass card left over in the Sea Cave deck. If you want more in-depth looks at these cards, you may see them in other adventures. I tend not to show cards that I'm not encountering, simply to not give spoilers for those cards in case we should encounter them at a later point. In any case, the sea caves are now closed, and we can move along to Alahazra's turn, with the knowledge that at the beach is the location where we will encounter the final enemy of our scenario that we need to defeat to close the beach. We flip a blessing from the blessings deck for Alahazra, and she may now explore the beach location, Somehow a barroom brawl has spilled over onto the beach. Let's take a look at what we need to do to defeat this barrier. Well, the check to defeat the barroom brawl is not very hospitable to Alahazra, where Celtio might be able to throw punches with the best of them. She does not have much in the way of dexterity or strength or melee prowess, which are the traits that this needs to defeat here. So the check is only a 5, but even for her that proves a little too difficult seeing as her ability is a d4 for strength and dexterity and she doesn't even have melee listed as a subcategory under strength. However, we recently got the Ruby of Charisma back into our hand, which is fortunate because we can recharge this to roll our Charisma die instead of the normal die on a non-combat check. Even though the ball brawl here has the potential to cause damage to us, it is not a combat check. We are trying to defeat a barrier that is in our way from exploring the beach. So, that being said, let's roll and see if she can successfully fight off the brawlers here. She rolled a 5 on her die. The check to defeat was a 5, so she just manages to pull off a win here. Her charisma would have allowed her to add 2 to her die roll, so technically we rolled a 7. So Alahazra throws a few punches in the name of justice, and we may keep exploring here if we have something that allows us to in this case, unfortunately, I do not have any further blessings or other cards that will allow me to keep exploring. So I will discard some things from my hand that are no longer serving a purpose in my thinking. The eye patch is taking up space in my hand that might be better served. So let's see what I draw in its place. We draw Fire Blade, which is an attack spell, which is good, and I must draw one more card. I draw an ally, the deck hand, which will allow me to actually continue exploring my location more than once on my next turn with Alahazra. It now becomes Celtiel's turn. Seeing as all other locations are closed, once we have flipped the blessing from the blessing deck, it only makes sense for him to come over to the beach and lend a hand. He will explore. We encounter a Bunyip. A Bunyip can deal damage that may not be reduced. That means we would take quite a bit of damage if we fail, depending on how badly we fail. Before you act, you must succeed at a Wisdom 9 check, or the difficulty of checks for the rest of your turn is increased by 1. That isn't the worst thing in the world, particularly because Celtiel is a physical attacker even if the bunyip got bumped up to a 10 difficulty to defeat he wouldn't be suffering so much which is fortunate because his wisdom is only a d4 so what he has in physical prowess he apparently completely lacks in sense so predictably we roll and we cannot achieve the wisdom 9 required so now all of our checks get a little bit more difficult for this turn. It's going to reveal the longsword, however. 
gets to roll a d8 for his strength or melee skill, plus an additional d8 according to the text here. He may discard it to add another d6, but that will be overkill, we hope. So we will not discard the longsword for this check. We'll simply roll a 2d8 and see if that plus our plus 3 modifier is enough to kill this. So we have 8 and 1 is 9 plus 3, 10, 11, 12. So even with the bunyip beefed up to 10, we've still beaten the bunyip which takes some pressure off of Alahazra because she's not as good at fighting so she no longer has to encounter that monster because Celtiel successfully killed it and it does not get shuffled back into the deck Heartbreak Hinson here is an ally in our hand like most allies he allows us to explore the location in this case we add the swashbuckling traits to checks during this exploration We've encountered a Sailor Ally, Charisma Diplomacy 6, so it's increased to 7 because of the Bunyip's effects. Let's see if we have what it takes to convince the Sailor to join our crew. Spoiler alert, my Charisma is only a D6, so it's fairly unlikely that I could have convinced him under normal circumstances and now it's just impossible but for form's sake I roll I almost persuaded the sailor to join our cause but he saw bunyip slime all over my character or something gross and so he was not too happy and walks away from us at this point, I may attempt to recharge a card in my discard pile. That's a spell. So I do have one spell, Force Missile, in my discard pile that I did not recharge earlier successfully. So I need an Arcane 6. We'll roll our D8 and see if I can pull this off. 3 plus 3. So I roll the 3. I have my plus three modifier to arcane, so I do in fact recharge force missile from my discard pile. I have to draw three cards for Celtiel to get up to his hand size of five here, which is all that I need to do on this turn, and in fact all I can do, and play will now transition to Alahazra. We flip a blessing for Alahazra. She will also explore she finds a large chest of all the things again she's not very good at strength melee or dexterity and she's already used her little gem trick to use her better die so she doesn't really have a whole lot going for her here except for her deckhand ally the deck hand has the following text. Recharge this card to add 1d6 to your non-combat strength or dexterity check. So she can give herself a fighting chance to do the dexterity disable 9 check on the large chest. So we instead get a d6 and a d4, which at least gives us a fighting chance versus this so let's see if we get lucky. If not, we may simply banish the barrier. Five and one is a six, so we gave it our best to pick the lock. However, the large chest remained inaccessible. We do not get weapons from the box. That's too bad, but that is the way this goes. At this point, we will also reset Alahazra's hand, drawing a sixth card into her hand to replace the card she played, the deck hand. Play will then transition to Celtiel. And we are getting down to the bottom of the deck, so somewhere soon we should encounter the final enemy here. We have found a potion of healing. Intelligence Craft 5 is the check we need here. His Craft Intelligence is a D8 plus 1. Let's just see if we can get the Potion of Healing. He rolls an 8, which is a very high roll. 
and high enough to acquire the potion of healing. Let me just hold on to this for now and see if anyone needs some healing at a later point. Most potion type items are one use item and must be banished. So at this point he'll just keep it in his hand. He has a blessing here that will allow him to keep exploring should he so choose. He plays the blessing of Phrasma. Since he's using it for just a simple exploration, we will not need to go into the other abilities that it has. He finds a pistol plus one. His dexterity is a d6. You need a dexterity of eight to claim this. Again, most of our characters will not benefit from a weapon that uses dexterity. So we will just roll for form's sake. He tries to pick up the pistol and almost shoots himself in the foot and decides to just let things well enough alone. At this point, I have five cards in my hand, including the Potion of Healing. I will just go ahead and use the Potion of Healing, banish this card, and choose a character at your location to shuffle 1d4 random cards from his discard pile into his deck. So, this is effectively a one-use cure spell. We'll roll the d4. I'm going to select Alahazra because she's slightly more hurt than I am. I get one plus one, so it wasn't a terribly impressive showing. However, it gives us a little more if we should have some problems up ahead here, which, seeing as we're close to the end, is not a very likely event, but you never know. Okay, so we've shuffled the cards into Alhazra's deck here, and it now will become her turn. Alright, the question Alahazra needs to ask herself here is, does she feel lucky? The answer is probably no, seeing as Celtiel is a slightly better combatant than she is. But, she's tempted to try anyway with the no guts, no glory mentality. So we flip over Kelizar the Brine Dragon. Let's see what he does to us. Kelizar the Brine Dragon has one nasty effect that happens to us before we even get to fight him. We must succeed at a Dexterity or Acrobatic 7 check or be dealt 1d4 acid damage as opposed to just one acid damage. Alahazra's Dexterity is so low that the likelihood of her succeeding at this is not very good. However, she does have a 6 card hand size and might be able to absorb the damage. Celtiel only has four cards in his hand and none of those cards are particularly useful to this check. Furthermore, he only has a dexterity of a d6, so he cannot succeed either. So in what I'm saying is that both characters will effectively take a d4 acid damage before the encounter even gets off the ground. Alright, so we've seen what happens with the dragon we're about to encounter, the brine dragon. Unfortunately, neither of my characters can viably succeed, so we're just going to go ahead and roll Alahazra's dexterity here. She rolls a 2, she does not succeed. Celtiel has a d6, as I mentioned. We roll his, he rolls a 4, he does not succeed either. We'll roll a d4 to see how much damage Alahazra would take. She would take 1 damage from this, so she has to take a card in her hand. We'll take fear as our damage, because it's a spell that she did not intend to use during this encounter. Then for Celtiel, let's see how much damage he has to take. Likewise, has to take one damage, so it he will take the spell strength as damage since he cannot use it to bolster Alahazra's check because she is not using a weapon that is a strength based weapon. She's going to be relying solely on her spell prowess here. So the dragon has a 16 combat check to defeat, as you may have noticed. In order to do this, we're going to use this spell Fireblade, which you have seen before. Fireblade says, for your combat check, discard this card to use your divine skill, plus 2d4, 
After playing this card, we can recharge it as with many spells. Also, Alahazra is going to be using a Blessing of the Gods to give her another d12. So she gets to roll 2d12 and 2d4 in an attempt to send Kelizar to a watery grave. Let's check and see if we succeed at beating a 16 with 2d12 and 2d4. We rolled quite well, a 10, and a 12 is already 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. So we have very much killed Kelizar, and we will reap the rewards the scenario offers. It should be noted that defeating Kelizar in and of itself does not end the scenario. However, when you defeat the main villain of a scenario, the location the villain was at is automatically closed. Thus, we do, in fact, end the scenario. Alright, let's look at these rewards here. So, the scenario card reward is that each character draws three random items from the box and may keep one and banish the other two. And we also get the plunder card that was put under our shackles pirate ship at the beginning of the scenario. The plunder card is a surgeon. The surgeon says, reveal this card and choose a character at your location. Shuffle a random card from her discard pile into her deck. Then recharge this card. Discard this card to explore your location. That might come in handy if we need a little bit of healing, but if we need significant healing it will not. So for Celtiel, I have the following three items. It's worth noting that characters can trade items after a scenario is completed. So if one of these seems better for Alahazra, for example, we could do that. I'm not particularly impressed with the Onyx of Constitution, mostly because it allows us to roll our Constitution die instead of a normal die for a non-combat check and the constitution of both of my characters is relatively low so for Celtiel it's only a d8 and for Alahazra it's a d6 so that's not particularly wonderful potion of fortitude is a one use item so I'm not terribly impressed with one use items generally speaking either out of Celtiel's items this looks like the best reward here Discard this card to reduce the damage dealt to you by 3. After playing this card, succeed at an Arcane or Divine 7 check to recharge it instead of discarding it. So, either of my characters could make good use out of that. We'll be banishing the Potion of Fortitude and the Onyx of Constitution. Let's take a look at Alahazra's rewards here. One I'm really not impressed with right out of the box here is the Powder Horn, which has a lot to do with ranged weapons, getting them back into your hand, getting weapons with a firearm trait. So my characters are not good at using dexterity weapons, so that one's pretty much out of the picture already. That leaves the Tot Flask, which allows us to, instead of banishing something that's a liquid like the potion of fortitude we could recharge it or bury it rather so seeing as I'm not keeping the potion of fortitude I will not be keeping that either this leaves the bracers of protection which might be useful for Alahazra seeing as she cannot hold an armor currently this reduces combat damage dealt to a character by one so the two rewards we will be keeping are the amulet of life and the bracers of protection this concludes my playthrough of the Sunken Treasure scenario. Thank you for watching, and please tune in when Joseph takes us through the final scenario of this adventure.